breakout discussion on some of the themes from the talk. Uh, and then we're going to do a question and answer session with the entire branch team. So Lois, Yuri, Grant, uh, Philip, and myself. So you can direct questions to and during the question and answer session to any member of the team, um, because you may want to pick up or follow on things that were from previous talks as well. So this is the seventh uh, talk uh, in a series of seven. And just to recap very briefly, um, we had a first couple of talks that I gave that were really introductory into the nature of anthroposophical path and anthroposophical meditation. Then Yuri did a wonderful talk on using writing as a way to cultivate inner culture. Grant gave a talk on Steiner's karma meditations and included some very important um, readings and exercises that people can use to um, help themselves in their un unfolding. Philip uh, did a wonderful talk on the higher self and the great Rosicrucian mantra, followed by Lois's wonderful talk on the Rose Cross meditation. I'm very proud of the team that I'm part of, so I hope I don't let them down tonight with tonight's final talk. And they'll, uh, <laughs> they'll help me out in the question periods for sure. So um, I really want to, um, this slide's gonna stay on for most of the talk. I'll sort of walk through it. Um, I really want to try and uh, sketch out tonight the journey of becoming a meditant. Um, now, in the first place, this journey is a highly individual journey. It happens differently for every single person. Uh, and yet there are common phases in it, common um, crises, common opportunities, common achievements that come through it. And I think, um, uh, important to uh, understand, or at least valuable to understand those common phases, because it can help build a bit of a map for where you're at in this process yourself. Um, and that having a map like that in front of you can give you some greater clarity, at least that's my hope from the talk, as to what the next steps are that you might want to take should you choose to take them. Um, now, Previously, when I was speaking, I think in the second lecture, I talked about there being two different paths of human development. That provided you're trying to be a good person, uh, you are headed toward enlightenment. That is the destiny of human beings who are trying to be good people, to achieve enlightenment. We're literally designed for it. And those two paths that are the, the sort of, um, longer and slower path of karma and reincarnation, where by going through life experiences, your soul gradually matures. And in that maturation process, as I said, pr provided you're trying to be a good person, the um, etheric astral uh, organs will develop and gradually you will be born into, this, into the higher world. You'll be, um, the organs will, will function and, and you'll have this moment of enlightenment where you cross over and recognize your I am at a higher level, uh, at which point you literally become a child of God as it's usually referred to, at least in Christian scriptures. All of us are headed toward that provided we're trying to be a good person. Now, if you're not trying to be a good person, then um, you, you move in a sense further away from the goal. And it's not like there's an alternate goal. It's just that you move further and further away from what a human being can become and what you yourself in your own uniqueness can become. So in a sense, you get further and further lost. Now, most people are at this stage of evolution doing both. We're both pursuing our goodness and uh, still engaged in all sorts of um, unethical or unmoral behaviors. Sometimes we know about it, sometimes we don't. Um, and so in this regard, there's a, a critical element about keeping this idea of trying to be a good person in your mind and, and having that be a fundamental thing. As Steiner describes it, it is the golden rule of the path. For every step in spiritual development, take three steps in the development of your character. And that relationship three to one has a significance to it. So it really not, it's not just try harder on the moral side. There's something quite real about the fact that you need to be working in thinking, feeling, and willing as a moral being for every step that you take forward in the path. So I wanted to give a bit of a, the other path of course is the straight narrow path of the meditant. So you have the long and 
uh, winding path of karma and meditate or karma and reincarnation and the steeper narrower path of the meditant. But I wanted to give a bit more of a nuanced understanding of those two things. So for starters, humanity as a whole is going through an evolution. And that evolution is taking us toward the time when these two paths will actually merge into one. In other words, where the only way to be striving to be a good person will be to be a meditant. They will actually kind of gather together at a certain point. We're not there yet, but we're headed there. Already we're at the age of the development of the consciousness soul. And the consciousness soul develops when a human being starts to um, interact with truth and goodness in a way that isn't conditioned by material existence which really means starting to understand and move towards some understanding of the reality of the spiritual world. That's the age that we're in now. So as human evolution unfolds, these two paths will gradually collapse into one, and it will be required for people to be working on the conscious development of their spiritual nature as part of striving to be a good person. We're headed there. The other part of this is that even if you fully take on the path of the meditant, you're still engaged in karma and reincarnation. It's not like you step away from that path, but that path does start to change. Certain things that you can go through as a meditant mean that you don't have to revisit them in future. So it does change what happens with your karma, um, but it also interweaves you with other people on the path more and more tightly as you go forward. So the path of meditation is really very much a team sport. And as the further you get in, involved with the path of the meditant, the more your destiny combines with the destiny of other future meditants. Um, in, in Steiner's wonderful mystery dramas, he tracks the uh, incarnations of a group of people through multiple incarnations and showing how the sacrifice of one enables the achievement of another. And so um, although your, your path of karma and reincarnation changes quite dramatically when you become a meditant, it's not like you leave that path, but the path becomes bound up with your becoming as a meditant and, and quite closely with other meditants that you get increasingly involved with over time. So I just wanted to present that, uh, that nuance so that you know, you, even though it's true to say that there are two paths to human development, the slow and gentle path of karma and reincarnation and the steeper, more difficult path of becoming a meditant, um, there, there are nuances to that, that that should be kept in mind. So let's look at the phases of the journey of becoming a meditant. Um, I'm, I think there's six that I've been able to come to understand so far. Um, this isn't something directly from Steiner. This is more from my sort of lived experience. As I said in the first meditator, the first session, I'm not um, qualified to teach the anthroposophical path. I'm a student of the anthroposophical path. And so um, what I can bring you is necessarily uh, from my uh, partial perspective. Um, and it's from that place that I can offer something that hopefully will be of some value to you. When I think about the journey of becoming a meditant, I think about, first of all, the precursors to somebody's meeting with anthroposophy in this life. And I think of three different things. I think about the experiences you've had in previous lives that have led you to some distance towards being able to become a meditant. And of course, that can be very wide and very different. But most people who have found their way to anthroposophy have some previous incarnations that have something of a, a orientation toward the spiritual or toward human evolution in a positive way. Then there's what happened between incarnations. And in, in the karma lecture, Steiner gives some remarkable information about um, the way the great time spirit, Mikael, gathers together people who are meant to meet anthroposophy and prepares them for that meeting. It would take us too far afield today to go into that, um, but it really is a very moving thing to realize that probably everybody on this call today 
was part of a spiritual training in the life between life before we incarnated. And that that, in some sense, prepared us, enabled us to recognize anthroposophy when we did. And then lastly, there's precursors in this life. For a lot of people who have met anthroposophy, if they think about their life prior to their meeting with anthroposophy, they can identify thoughts or feelings or experiences that, in a sense, prepared them to meet anthroposophy. When I was a young boy, I was telling Grant this story. I haven't told many people this story, but I think it's, it's probably worth sharing. When I was a young boy, about seven, I think, six or seven, I somehow got on the idea that the world that I lived in was constructed. And uh, I didn't quite understand it, but I could feel the presence of something behind it. And I thought that if I spun around really quickly, I could see whoever it was creating the world in the process of creating it. So for a period of time between ages six and seven, I spent the odd time spinning around really quickly. My mother came to be quite worried about my mental health, but, uh, but what this really was, was a precursor feeling of the spiritual world behind the physical world and my somewhat childish attempt to figure out if I could catch them in the act. Obviously, I was never fast enough, but, but in that moment of trying that, even though I'd been forgotten about it, that kind of precursor experience prepares a person to meet anthroposophy. And of course, that's one example. There's millions of other examples of how you can have uh, precursors in the life that, you, that lead you into your meeting with anthroposophy. The, the second phase of becoming a meditant really is your encounter with anthroposophy. And again, as widely different as there are people on the phone. Um, but I think it's really useful to think carefully about your experience, about how you encountered anthroposophy. It always has destiny clues in it, even if it seems very mundane if you, or very prosaic. If you can remember how you encountered anthroposophy, there are clues to your destiny in that, uh, in that process. Now, for some people who grow up in anthroposophy, who are born into it, say children of Waldorf teachers or something like that, there's a slightly different process in that the encounter doesn't happen in the way that it happens to somebody who comes to anthroposophy from outside. It happens in a moment when they say, what is anthroposophy for me? In other words, they still have to relate it to their ego at a certain point. Even if they grew up in it, at a certain point, they have to say, what does it mean to me? And that's their encounter. And again, the conditions of that encounter hold, hold information about your destiny. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Then there's something of a journey between encountering anthroposophy and being able to say, I am an anthroposophist. And this journey can take days or moments for some people, and it can take decades for others. I think one of the challenges with I am an anthroposophist is people often think of it like more like something like I'm a dentist or I'm a, I'm a gymnast, that it's some kind of achievement. There have to be a certain level of capacity in order to give yourself the name. I don't really think that's the best way to understand it. I think a better way to understand it is more like saying I'm Canadian or I'm from the United States. It has more to do with identifying yourself as belonging to this stream and feeling inwardly that you belong to this stream. And when you can say that, when you can say, I am an anthroposophist, even though it's not a statement of achievement, not like you have to know a certain amount or have you know a certain shiny aura or something like that, but even though it's not a statement of achievement, the moment you say it to yourself, I am an anthroposophist, somewhere you'll start to feel a sense of responsibility. It's not a value neutral thing to say, I am an anthroposophist. It always, consciously or unconsciously, starts to kindle in the person some sense of responsibility. I quite definitely talked with people and my impression after talking with them was they don't want to say I am an anthroposophist because they don't want to feel the weight of that responsibility. 
Um, so it is un an unavoidable part of saying I am an I am an anthroposophist, starting to feel some sense of responsibility around that. Now, what's critical when you are able to say I am an anthroposophist is to find the center of your being and your sense of initiative in it. When Grant was uh, giving his uh, talk about karma, he, he referenced a quote that Steiner, uh, where Steiner talks about the fact that initiative lies in the karma of every anthroposophist. And again, this can mean a myriad of different things, but ultimately it means that if you find in your inner being, in your, the core of yourself, the, this, this statement, I am an anthroposophist, then you need to be uh, watchful and, and uh, uh, present of the opportunities that life brings you. And it's not always the case that life brings you tons of opportunities, but it always is the case that life will continue to bring you opportunities no matter where you are, no matter how old you are or what you're doing. There are always opportunities once the phrase I am an anthroposophist lives in your heart. And trying to be awake to those, uh, those those opportunities, trying to be awake in initiative to what your karma brings you is a critical component going forward. Now, at a certain point, anthroposophists generally start to want to be a meditant. And they experience this in a lots of different ways. One way that they experience it is joining the class, the class lessons. In, in, in reality, the class is meant for people who are meditants. Um, it's quite explicitly stated so in a couple of the class lessons. In reality, most of the class participants aren't meditants. In other words, they don't actually have an active meditative practice. Um, and so there's a, something funny about the anthroposophical movement in this regard, that most of the people who are in the class for meditants are not meditants. And I think that's something that we need to think about and wonder a bit about, um, because there is a something of a something of a, a, a difference between Steiner's day and our day in that the so many people in the class do not have a regular meditative practice. Some do, but not as many as you might think. Now the desire to become a meditant, this is the gray area, stage four, which is the stage where most people are, it's the stage I would identify myself at, is a kind of gray area where you're striving to become something, trying to understand something, uh, working at something, but generally speaking, not being able to uh, completely realize it. Uh, from time to time, I make it into stage five for a while, and then I slip back into stage four. And the real difference is the regularity of the meditation. What happens when you, when you develop, when, once you've studied the path sufficiently that you understand the exercises and what they do, how they change you, and once you start working on the path on, in a regular way, say, beginning with a meditation every morning and every night, and then perhaps eventually adding one in the middle of the day, and then eventually, as you develop the capacity, adding meditations on other rhythms, like weekly rhythms or monthly rhythms or seasonal rhythms or even annual rhythms. Once you get to the point where you're able to do more work in that sense, it's a little bit like an athlete. You know, an athlete develops by uh, getting their body, physical body, to be able to do more work over time. And a meditant, it's a similar process. You're able to do more work over time. The, the frequency and the quality of the meditation in, increases. But when that happens, when you start to move from four to five, you start to encounter uh, difficulties, including pressure and pain. Um, the, the, the repetitiveness of meditation does function like a homing beacon on the powers, the creative powers of the spiritual world. And as you start to meditate, if you can sustain a meditation, a high quality meditation every morning and every night for three months, you'll feel this. You'll feel the intensity of the spiritual world starting to sort of massage into you. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it can be a challenging experience. And um, certainly lots of the people that I've talked with who meditate more seriously find themselves taking their foot off the gas and slowing the car down because they're trying to manage that experience. Um, 
The other piece about wanting to be a meditant is at a certain point in the journey anthroposophically, you recognize that from here on in, from the creation of the consciousness soul on in, we're into the zone of co-creation. We literally are past our childhood. Uh, we now have to work in order for the subsequent development to occur. And as that becomes clearer in people's minds, they tend to want to actually participate in that process um, and to find and, and, and to recognize that the meditations in knowledge of the higher worlds, the application of the philosophy of freedom to your thought life, the deepening study of anthroposophy, all of these things start to link up with that feeling of obligation that you had when you were able to say, I am an anthroposophist. Because what that means is I am now conscious of the fact that my development is partly dependent upon me. That the spiritual world has brought us up to the point where we have to undertake the continued work. And that starts to become a desire. So let's talk about what happens when you get into phase five, when you really are a meditant. There's a whole number of things that happen. And like I say, I'm, I'm somewhere between four and five, five on a good day, four on a bad day. And that's not uncommon to, to find yourself in that long gray zone for quite a while. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about how I understand going from four to five and why it's challenging. But let's first talk a little bit about what happens when you get into phase five, because you can experience aspects of this prior. It's just that they get more and more uh, intense. So the first thing that it develops, uh, and it's quite a wonderful feeling when it's there, is really a sense of being on the right path. You can feel that your meditative life when you've been able to sustain it for some weeks in a row is actually uh, something that is really very much bringing you forward to become the person you can be. So it's a very interesting experience of being on the right path because at the same time, as it is, you know, a, a sense that's common to people, it, it also uniquely gives you a sense of being on the right path for you as an individual. And so there's something quite mysterious that a whole bunch of individuals with their very individual nature performing the meditative work can have a similar feeling that this is helping me become the person I am meant to be. It also comes despite the sense of, of, of being on the right path with pressures and pains. The pressure is a kind of ever present thing that you just have to learn how to bear up. The pains are odd. You can have very strange pains on the path. Uh, you can have pains around the chakras. You can have uh, shifting pains in different parts of the body. Um, and um, they just have to be born there. They have to do with the fact that that through the work of the path, your astral and your etheric are starting to become more organized, especially the astral is starting to become more organized. The way you think throughout the entire day, the way you feel throughout the entire day is, is beginning to uh, have, have a kind of inner structure that's not there when you're not meditating, that's not uh, encouraged or stimulated when you're not meditating. And that, that shifting can cause all sorts of interesting pains. I'll give you one example from my own experience. At a particular time, all the tiny little muscles around my voice box got inflamed and were very painful. The doctor had no idea what in the world was going on. And I realized after that this had to do with a particular meditation that I was doing, something shifting that went right down into the physical body. Despite the sense of pressure and pain, there is an overall sense of well-being. This is a bit paradoxical, but you can feel the path working on you and making you healthier and stronger, even at the same time as you're bearing this kind of increasing inner pressure and these odd pains. And the sense of well-being usually involves a kind of eradication of a feeling of anxiety or a diminishment of it. Uh, um, and a sense of just sort of overall healthiness. Uh, and that quite naturally leads into feeling more confident and feeling your capacities develop. Um, most people who get to the point of phase five and in, in becoming a meditant are 
experience themselves getting much more competent at all sorts of things in life. Um, at the same time as you have this competency, uh, very specific temptations start to show up in your life along with the conditions to fulfill those temptations. This is quite, I don't know how to say it other than bizarre or magical, but as you develop uh, um, in becoming a meditant, you will be given opportunities to um, act out your lower nature. So if you're somebody who's interested in being a thief in some way or another, you will be given an opportunity to steal a lot of money and get away with it. Um, or what have you, whatever your temptation is. If your temptation is to be dominant to other people, you'll be put in a position where you can be quite dominant and quite crushing to other people. And all of this is something that is brought to you as a kind of, uh, I would say, preliminary test uh, in terms of your own capacity to manage your lower nature. Meditation naturally um, distills the higher and lower self out from each other. This culminates ultimately when you meet the guardian of the, of, the, of the threshold, who represents in a sense and looks like you, but, but, but um, in the guise of all your unredeemed karma. And so this process starts with this, with this distillation process and the appearance of, of not just temptations, but temptations and the opportunity to satisfy them. So as you're becoming more, uh, as you're developing more capacity as a person, the capacity includes the capacity to satisfy your temptations, which is why they become more serious. You also have this experience of the uprising of new thoughts and ideas, brand new thoughts and ideas, and some of them can strike you as very odd at first. So for example, you might have the thought, nobody in the spiritual world has a face. But one hand, that's an obvious thought. Of course, nobody has a face in the spiritual world. A face is a physical thing. But then you think, well, wait a second. I connect faces with how I recognize people. And then you realize, okay, so that means there must be a way of coming to recognize somebody without seeing their face. Okay, how does that work? Well, if we pay attention to when we meet somebody, we certainly see their face, and because we're physical beings, we tend to notice their face or focus on it, but we also have a sense of their personality. And my sense of, for example, Grant's personality is very different than my sense of Lois's personality, two people that I know well. Um, in the spiritual world, the experience of meeting somebody has much more to do with this felt sense of their personality than seeing a face. So it's a strange series of thoughts, but that kind of thought starts to emerge as you, in inwardly ways, start to prepare for spiritual experiences. Then uh, at a certain point when you're meditating regularly for long periods of time, even can sometimes be earlier, you will start to get visitations by Rudolf Steiner. Now, I don't know what to say about this. I've talked to a number of people who've had this experience. It's a little bit like he's showing up to check up on you. You'll see his face in your mind's eye, or you'll feel a sense of his presence, his personality. And um, some people find him showing up and zipping off very quickly. Other people sort of, he sticks around until you sort of receive something from him. But there's, it's unavoidable. You will, if you continue to meditate in a regular and intensive way, have these odd visitations by the teacher. There is a real connection to anybody on the meditative path with the being of Rudolf Steiner. And that continues on. And because we know of him in his last incarnation, you know, if he shows up in your mind's eye, you tend to see the picture that you associate with him. And then lastly, I would say there is the, this growing and intensifying sense of the nearness of the spirit, both inside the self and out in nature. It's as if the um, as if the veil of Maya is starting to thin, and you're starting to feel everywhere the presence of the spirit. So I want to talk now about how you get from four to five, and this really represents sort of the the height of what I can out of my own experience tell you, and that has to do with what I've decided to call finding love in the desert. Um, and 
it really has to do with the fact that even though meditation is something that leads you toward becoming your true self, you run out of steam for it unless you're doing it for somebody else. It's very paradoxical. But if you try to meditate, seriously meditate, half an hour in the morning, half an hour at night, day after day after day after day, you will get to the point where anything in yourself that says, I'm doing this for me, burns out. Your egotism will literally burn out and you'll say, mm, I'd rather watch YouTube flicks or I'd rather watch the TV or I'd rather do any I'm just going to go to bed tonight, whatever it is, because there's not enough in it for the ego to meditate that way. The only motivation that I've found and continue to work with that's strong enough to sustain a true meditative life uh, is love for other people. It's a paradox that is, I think, implicit in the meditative practice, that you can't really become who you want to become. You can't find the energy for it. You can't find the will for it unless you do it for other people. If you're trying to become uh, a spiritually awakened for yourself, you'll, 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 you'll basically stop the process. It's too hard. The only thing that's strong enough is caring for other people. So what does that mean? You're late at night, you've worked all day, it's 11 o'clock, you wanna to go to sleep, but you haven't done your meditation. You say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. You say in your mind, I'm doing this because it's good for the world. I'm doing this because the world needs the effort I'm about to put into meditation in order for it to move forward. Yes, it will help me move forward, but I'm doing this as part of the team of meditants that I'm connected with. I'm doing this as part of the anthroposophical movement. I'm doing this as part of the homeopathic impulse of anthroposophy in the great human society that we're all part of. And then you might not feel the love at first, you know? It's a little bit like those old pumps. You know those old pumps where you had to pump the handle a couple of times? First couple of times you don't get anything, and then you get a little bit of water, and if you keep pumping the handle, eventually the water comes out. It's like that. If out of a free decision you choose to meditate because you love the deed, then the power of the meditation will kick in. And I find that whenever I can be clear enough in my head to say I'm meditating for love of the deed, that means it's a free decision. Even though I might not feel a lot of love at first, even though I might have to, you know, pump the handle a bunch of times before anything starts to flow, those are the meditations where I know I'm making progress. And that's really when you, when you get to the point where you are meditating regularly. You don't miss meditations because if you miss meditations, you don't feel right. You don't feel good. And where the meditation is powered by the love that you found in the desert of your own ego. That's when the meditation really starts to click in and where you really start to make significant progress. And I, know, I, do, I can see now from phase five to phase six, I, can, I get how uh, once the meditant really is living as a meditant all day long, how gradually they become a chila, an advanced student, where they, they get to the point where they're having regular spiritual experiences and a kind of mystical inner life opens for them and the outer world starts to, the veil that we talked about, starts to thin to the point where things are shining through it. Your dream life changes, you start to have experiences in the deep insensible parts between dreams and so on. And the thing about becoming a chila is if you can achieve that in this life, between this life and the next life, you can be given a task by Rudolf Steiner. To become a chila, to become an advanced student means that you can now, um, in a sense, be tasked with doing something in the future. And so that's a very important uh, uh, achievement. You are, in a certain sense, safe hands for uh, participating with the true leaders of humanity. Of course, your first tasks will be, you know, smaller, but that's that's where you start to really, in a sense, uh, work alongside the the initiates in in preliminary ways. So that's the bulk of what I wanted to talk about today. 
uh, to try to give a sense of that. And as I was saying, you know, my hope is that that gives a bit of a map for people to situate themselves and, and to think a little bit about sort of what next steps they have. Um, I wouldn't want to cast all this in stone. If I give this lecture two months from now, it might be different again, because it's still very much something I'm learning, but I hope it's of some value for you. Um, having done that, I would like to just turn it over to Grant to, to read this particular verse of Steiner, which I think really speaks to the path of becoming a meditant. So I'll, um, I'll turn it over to Grant for a moment. Thanks, Rob. The destiny verse. The wishes of the soul are springing. The deeds of the will are thriving. The fruits of life are maturing. I feel my fate. My fate finds me. I feel my star. My star finds me. I feel my goals in life. My goals in life are finding me. My soul and the great world are one. Life grows more radiant about me. Life grows more arduous for me grows more abundant within me. Thank you, Grant. So we're going to go into discussion groups now for 20 minutes or so. Um, and there, here's two guiding questions for you. Feel free to, you know, talk about other things that came up from for you in the lecture. But one would be, where are you in your journey of becoming a meditant? And again, I would say, you know, um, we don't say, oh, it's better to be an eight-year-old than it is to be a two-year-old or better to be a 40-year-old than it is to be a 20-year-old. That doesn't make any sense. It also doesn't really make any sense to say, is it better to be further along the path? It's where you are. It's a developmental thing. So um, feel free to, to be, you know, uh, it's not, not a question of judgment. Um, and then what are the messages for how you... I don't know what I was writing here. I was trying to say, what are the messages folded into how you encountered anthroposophy is what that's supposed to be. In other words, if you think about how you encountered anthroposophy, even if it seems very prosaic or very mundane, there's destiny messages uh, built into that. And what, uh, so maybe the group might wanna talk about how they encountered anthroposophy and what they, uh, what aspects of their destiny they can see and how that encounter occurred. Anyway, those are two um, potential guiding questions, but feel free to talk about anything else that, that emerged for you in the context of the lecture, and we'll see you in 20 minutes or so. Um, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful time in the breakout groups and the discussions. Um, we have about a half an hour left, and um, uh, is Philip on the line? I didn't see Philip so far. Is Philip here? Okay, so then um, feel free to ask questions. Um, what's up on the on the on the slide right now? On the left are a series of anthroposophical meditations, and on the right are a series of. Um, thoughts or or aspects of anthrop of the anthroposophical path um, including some that could be considered meditations and uh, feel free to ask about any of these or anything else that you want to ask about and you can ask questions to any of uh, the people who made presentations so that's grant yuri philip lois and myself Thanks so much for everyone for coming. It's obviously made it a rich experience to have so many people uh, participating in these events. And uh, uh, it's wonderful to be part of a movement like this where people are thinking about and, and working towards uh, the life of the spirit. So thank you to all of you and to my branch colleagues. Thank you so much. I'm proud of you guys. Mm -hmm.